All right, guys, how you doing? Got another edition of Monday Nights with Mike live stream Q and A. Ask me anything health related. And obviously, I'm Mike Caveman from MikeCaveman.com and Paleo Prime Rhode Island. You know the deal. So yeah, put your questions and comments down in the comment box, and the live stream should be over there. And yeah, so unless you're on you know mobile device, in which case it'll be at the bottom. You know the deal. All right. Anyway, what we're gonna do? Oh, let me turn off the auto there. Whoops, some technical difficulties already. Awesome. So as you might have seen from the preview image, what we are going to be working on today is we're going to be talking a little about viral infections and probiotics, specifically like in Megaspore, in terms of their benefits potentially for, uh, in terms of the benefits uh, for those viral infections, you know, how that works, the words that I said, yeah, those things. So basically how viral infections could be combated using probiotics, particularly those found in Megaspore, but in general as well. Oh, I just can't win right now. Anyway, moving forward, we're also talking about the health benefits of seaweed and how that could be uh, beneficial. And uh, yeah, quick coastal crab kombucha break right here. And <laughs> those you may know, the unfortunately the Babylon farmers market is done, but they did start up over in Sherry's over in Babylon Village starting last week. And it's like my first batch today. All right, let's hop on in though. Let's take a look at some of the research we have regarding probiotic benefits for viral infections. So we have here, there's a 2014 article in the European Journal of Clinical, uh, Clinical Microbiology and Infectious Disorders, uh, Clinical Microbiology and Infectious Disorders or Diseases. Mm, infectious diseases is the name of the journal and yeah i'm not going to try and pronounce the author's name but unfortunately this was behind a paywall but because you're here with me right now you'll be able to look at the actual article so right here probiotics in respiratory infections so basically viral respiratory infections are the most common diseases in humans and also if you want to get to the um to the abstract if you want to take a look at that it's down in the description box down below but from there, you can see if you can get a hold of it. Otherwise, reach out to me. We can, I can send it over to you, but we can move forward for now. So viral respiratory infections are the most common diseases in humans. A large range of etiological agents challenge the development of efficient therapies. What they're trying to say there is that there are a lot of different causes. could be viral, bacterial, fungal, etc. Research suggests that probiotics are able to decrease the risk or duration of respiratory infection symptoms. However, the antiviral mechanisms of probiotics are unclear. The purpose of this paper is to review the current knowledge of the effects of probiotics on respiratory virus infections and to provide insights on the possible antiviral mechanisms of probiotics. A PubMed and Scopus database search was performed up to January 2014, which was when this paper was being written, uh, using appropriate search terms on probiotic and respiratory virus infections in cell models animal models, and in humans, and reviewed for their relevance. Altogether, 33 clinical trials were reviewed. The studies varied highly in study design, outcome measures, probiotics, dose, and matrices used. 28 trials were reported that probiotics had beneficial effects in the outcome of respiratory tract infections, and five showed no clear benefit. Only eight studies reported in, uh, investigating viral etiology from the respiratory tract, and one of these reported a significant decrease in viral load. Based on the experimental studies, probiotics may exert antiviral effects directly in probiotic virus interaction, probiotic virus interaction, or via simulation of the immune system. And it's the latter one there, the simulation of the immune system that's gonna be more pertinent overall for our purposes. But what they're saying there is that they investigated whether or not the virus, the benefit from the probiotic is coming from actual antiviral properties, the ability to attack the virus itself, or from just generalized immune system benefits coming from the boosting of the microbiota through the probiotic administration. Although probiotics seem to be beneficial in respiratory illnesses, the role of probiotics on specific viruses has not been investigated sufficiently. Due to the lack of confirmatory studies and varied data available, more randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trials in different age populations investigating probiotic dose response, comparing probiotic strains genera, and elucidating the antiviral effect mechanisms are necessary. So at the time when this paper was published, not a lot of research out there yet. Now, that was three years ago, first of all. 
almost four years ago now, because it was January of 2014. Second of all, <coughs> excuse me. Second of all, um, the the now the nature of the microbiome, no, the nature of the microbiome in general is still just emerging. So the research specifically to it is not the best as of yet, anyway. But you know, most of what we've seen so far is pretty damn impressive. But moving forward, respiratory tract infections (RTIs) are a major cause of morbidity and mortality worldwide. Viral pathogens are the most common etiological agent of acute respiratory disease. So just to quickly break that down, basically viruses are the most common cause of, you know, short-term lung disorders. And they cause, they're also the most ca major, it's the most common cause of both morbidity or disease and or mortality, obviously death. Yeah. The social economic impact of viral respiratory disease is substantial due to hospitalizations, medical costs, missed work and school and daycare absences. For instance, estimates show that viral respiratory tract illnesses, most common colds, most, sorry, mostly common colds, cost uh, the uh, cost forty billion dollars U.S. annually in the United States alone. <coughs> Excuse me. There are over two hundred different types of viruses which cause RTIs in humans. Human rhinoviruses (HRV) are the largest group of respiratory viruses, comprising over one hundred fifty serotypes. In humans, the predominant illness caused by HRV is the acute upper respiratory tract infection, also known as the common cold. The second most common virus infecting humans are the human enteroviruses, HEV, which are associated with clinical manifestations ranging from mild respiratory symptoms to serious conditions. Influenza viruses, respiratory syncytial, uh, syncytial, 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 hold on, let's figure that one out, syncytial. Sync deal. Okay, sorry. Okay, respiratory sync deal virus, RSV, and adenoviruses are also major causative agents of both upper and lower respiratory tract infections. In addition, many other virus or virus groups cause RTIs. Parainfluenza viruses, coronaviruses, cause a broad spectrum of respiratory diseases ranging from mild up to uh, yeah. Anyway, in recent years, the rapid development of high throughput molecular techniques. Several viruses associated with respiratory disease, such as human Boca virus, human metanumavirus, and new, new coronaviruses, HKU1 and NL63, have been identified as well. Yeah. Anyway, <coughs> the prevention of viral respiratory infections is an important challenge to public health. Currently, the only effective antivirals and vaccines for the prevention and treatment of respiratory tract infections are available against influenza viruses and adenoviruses. For viruses causing common cold, HRV, HEV, no effective therapies are available. Large varieties of etiological agents and increasing antibiotic and antiviral resistance challenge development of efficient therapies. Consequently, it is of importance to find alternative and safe ways to reduce the risk of these infections. Even partially effective therapy in the treatment and prevention of viral RTIs, such as the common cold, could have an impact on reducing morbidity and economic losses due to illness. So basically be able to say, even if it can only cause you to stay at work for longer and to reduce the length of the disease and the symptomology, that's still a benefit. Probiotics are defined as live microorganisms that can confer a health benefit on the host. The most common types of microbes used as probiotics are lactobacilli and bifidobacteria which are generally consumed as part of fermented foods, such as yogurts or dietary supplements. Criteria for probiotic bacteria include that the bacterial strain, one, must be able to survive in the gastrointestinal tract and proliferate in the gut, two, should exert benefits to the host through growth and or activity in the human body, three, should be non-pathogenic and non-toxic, and four, provide protection against pathogenic microorganisms by means of multiple mechanisms, three, and five, should be lacking transferable antibiotic resistance. So real quick on that one, specifically regarding number one with respect to its ability to survive in the GI tract. <coughs> Excuse me, a common problem with lot, those strains I mentioned before, lactobacilli and bifidobacteria that we, as we talked about before, they do not generally survive the, the digestive tract, particularly the stomach. Your stomach acid should be killing the vast majority of them on the way in. Even though they are beneficial, your stomach acid doesn't really care and they generally will die on the way in. That's where something like megaspore comes in really well is because the bacillus strain spores, those of the bacillus genus, 
actually stay in that spore form. They stay dormant and are able to make it through to the colon where they're supposed to proliferate. More on that later. Most promising health effects of probiotics in human intervention studies include the amelioration of acute diarrhea in children, relief of children's milk allergy or atopic dermatitis, and relief of irritable bowel syndrome. Probiotics are likely to have an impact, though, oh, sorry, through gut mucosa by balancing local microbiota by inhibiting the growth of pathogenic microorganisms. So basically, your gut mucosa, which I talked about before, so that's the lining of the gut. Uh, DGL is great for that in particular, but it's one of the main layers of your gut lining, your GI tract. And what it does is it helps to take down, helps to mitigate, inhibit the growth of pathogenic, the bad bacteria. Also, it's helped to, so it's thought to help by enhancing local and systemic immune responses. So it's going to help to boost your immune system, help to regulate that immune response. They may also influence the composition and activity of microbiota in the intestinal contents, so helping to increase microbial diversity. Considering the beneficial effects of probiotics and virus infections, specific probiotics have been suggested to be effective in alleviating the duration and severity of acute rotavirus gastroenteritis. In addition, increasing evidence shows that probiotics are beneficial in RTIs, or respiratory tract infections, which in most cases are of viral origin. However, the mechanisms behind these effects are largely unknown. So going through this, basically, we have to think about their aim, the methods with which they found the studies they were looking at, the animal studies, the clinical trials in children, and you can go through this yourself. Again, either find the paper. So I link to the abstract down below because it is behind the paywall. If you can get access to it, great. If you can't, reach out to me. I can probably get you a copy. <coughs> <laughs> and uh, funny enough, myself, that's actually why we weren't here last week. Unfortunately, I had, remember in the beginning of the year, I had a, a condition known as Periosis rosea, which is a non-contagious viral infection. Funny that we're talking about that, right? Which went and comes out after a stress event. And unfortunately, following Thanksgiving, um, it appeared that something stressed me out around that time. And I had a actual uh, reoccurrence of it relapse and what ended up happening i'm getting like my whole arms were covered in the breakout from the pityos rosea again very unfortunate very sucked definitely sucked but fire cream was able to clear that up and part of the reason though was that i hadn't taken the spores in about two weeks um so my immune system was definitely down because of that and then once we add the stress event i was able to have that breakout again now real quick on uh, side note on that was there was actually a back order on the spores. Fortunately, we are back in stock and we came back in stock literally the day after I realized. And uh, as we can see here, hold on, I can't see my own camera right now. I'm blocking the paper. Oh, <coughs> oh come on now. Ugh. As we can see here, we are good again. Awesome. Unfortunately, I am at the tail end. My body is still trying to clear out a little bit left of the viral load, but I did have a pretty gnarly uh, upper respiratory tract infection before I was able to get back on the spores. I started initially with grapefruit seed extract, echinacea, and all that fun stuff, and it worked well. However, you know, they all were beneficial, but um, right now we're at the tail end. I feel great though. that particular day, that first weekend, I slept for like 30 hours, and then I got the spores in, putting the fire cream on, and feeling much, much better, but I still have the last tail ends of that cough, but whatever. Anyway, I'm human too, unfortunately. Not a robot yet. Don't want to be a robot. I, this whole cyborg future, no, not for me. They uh, say, was it the uh, synchronicity or the singularity? The singularity that talking about Elon Musk and stuff? Not for me. I'm good. You can, well, I'm dead, I'm dead. Thanks. Anyway. So now that I've rambled on enough about that, I'm caught up to pace. We, if you go through that study, you can look through some of the results and specific things between the mice, between humans, between the in vitro studies. But let's look at the possible mechanisms of action of probiotics in respiratory virus infections. Clinical and animal studies have demonstrated that specific probiotics have antiviral effects, but the underlying mechanisms are unclear. Additionally, the strain to strain variation may be relatively large concerning strain properties and e efficacy. Possible antiviral mechanisms of probiotics include hindering the adsorption, which is basically, so versus absorption, which is basically brought in, adsorption is like sticking to it and bringing it out. So basically, the viruses will stick to the mucosal wall. So it will hinder, it will prevent the adsorption, 
of the virus, um, basically making the mucosa less sticky, making them slide off essentially. Pretty gross oversimplification, but you get the idea, hopefully. Cell internalization of the virus, so making sure that we're stopping that process from going on. Production of metabolites and substances with direct antiviral effect, so basically killing the virus itself, producing uh, compounds that can kill it. <clears throat> and crosstalk, immunomodulation, regulating of the immune system with the cells and establishing, uh, establishing the antiviral protection. Possible mechanisms of probiotics against, anti, uh, against respiratory viruses are presented in figure one. So let's move down to figure one. Let's see if we can get that one popped up here. Here we go. Is that figure one? That is figure one. So the different ways that it could potentially happen. So we have our nice, pretty little, uh, <laughs> little the diagram here. So that is our epithelium, which is the basic lining that you think of for the gastrointestinal tract. That's what's moving everything. It's keeping everything sealed. We have our microvilli right there. The lumen is the layer on top of that. On the inside is the lamina propria. So inside there, here are a couple. So we'll actually break down with the numbers here. So actually, rather than me just rambling, I'll just read it to you. So number one, coming in here, we have our probiotic bacteria may bind directly to the virus and inhibit the virus attachment to the cell host receptor or the host cell receptor. So right here, the probiotic comes in, which are the little circle guys, the virus, the circle with the little nubs on the end. So it locks together, prevents it from entering. Number two, adhesion of probiotics on the epithelial surface may block viral uh, attachment by steric hindrance, cover receptor sites in non-specific manner, or by competing for specific carbohydrate receptors. So in number two, basically what happens is the probiotics come in first and they bind to the wall. By locking into the wall, they prevent the viruses from getting through, or they could actually um, they can actually go to the different receptors. So they have to get in somehow. So there's different carbohydrate receptors that they can use, the virus can use to get into your cell, to your system. So it can prevent that as well. <coughs> Excuse me. <sighs> Number three, probiotics may induce mucosal regeneration. Intestinal mucins may bind to the viruses and inhibit the adherence to epithelial cells and inhibit viral replication. So number three, so basically helps to produce, produce more of the mucus. And by producing the mucus, again, the virus cannot bind to your epithelial cell. So it gets stuck right there. We have number four, probiotics show direct antimicrobial activity against the pathogens by producing antimicrobial substances. So number four, right over here, they produce compounds that can actually outright kill the virus. Five, induction of low-grade nitric oxide production and dehydrogenase production, which may have antiviral activities. So number five over here, the, so the production of hydrogen peroxide and NO2, or dehydrogenase, but if you look at it, it's H2O minus. So dehydrogenase to me, not, not, um, not uh, H2O2, but anyway, <laughs> which would be H2OH would be the, uh, the hydrogenase. Hydrogenase. I can't pronounce words right now. <laughs> so back to it. Six. Modulation of immune response through the epithelial cells. So here, what they can do is they can go and release different uh, chemical mediators. So INFS, IL-1B, so interferons, uh, interleukin-1 beta, tumor necrosis alpha, alpha, it's TNF-A, IL-6, interleukin-6, and other, chemo keto other chemokines. So these are different mediators, in, um, immune responses. Number seven. Modulation and activation of immune responses through macrophages and dendritic cells. Again, another part of your normal host immune system. You can stimulate those macrophages. Eight, upon activation, CD8 plus T lymphocytes differentiate into cytotoxic T lymphocytes, uh, which destroy virus infected cells. So we get down to nine. The production of the CD4 can go and create the ability to destroy those viruses, or at least the cells that are infected thereof. Then we go down. To nine, so I was eight was where? Sorry, here. You go this way. So that's number eight, CD eight. Then the CD four, uh, T lymphocyte differentiate into T one and T uh, Th one, Th two cells. So we have Th one going this way, Th two going this way. From there, T helper cell type uh, activates phagocytes, which promote virus killing. They basically engulf. So the macrophages come along and they engulf that viral cell again. Then we have there. Uh, 
uh, which travel to secondary lymphatic organs and mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue. So that's the malt tissue and differentiate into immunoglobulin. So in that immune response, you think about, you probably heard about immunoglobulins like IgA, IgG, IgE. Those are when something invades, your body releases those immunoglobulins to basically help to clear out that system or that invader. So in this case, it's the production of uh, the immunoglobulins to help clear it out. Okay. Uh, which may migrate back to the infection site. And then number 12, finally, they secretory act, uh, antibodies neutralize the virus. So in that process, they go and produce antibodies. So part of that immunoglobulin response is they first create an antibody antigen response, um, base, uh, antibody antigen repair round three. Antibody antigen pair from there, they, uh, those antibodies can neutralize the virus. So again, so you either can, the number of ways is that it can stop the lining, the adsorption to the wall. It can produce different compounds that can kill the virus directly. It can produce chemical mediators that can kill the virus, or it can basically boost the immune system to help to kill the virus through a number of steps. So yeah, going back from there, those are possible mechanisms. So antagonism to respiratory viruses. The respiratory tract is covered by mucosal epithelial surfaces, which are constantly exposed to numerous microorganisms and serve as a primary ports of entry for respiratory viruses. So normally that strong wall shouldn't be a problem. It's also a key reason why we want to avoid certain foods, the foods that can damage your epithelial layer. Well, those can make you more susceptible to pathogenic infection. What you eat does make you more susceptible or less susceptible to disease. So virus attachment to a host cell is the first essential step in the disease process, and therefore interruption of this attachment could be beneficial to the host. Probiotic bacteria may bind directly to the virus and inhibit virus attachment to the host receptor cell. For instance, there's evidence that specific strains of lactobacilli are able to bind and inactivate vesicular stomatitis virus, flu-like virus in vitro, so in cell petri dish. Probiotics may also show direct antimicrobial activity, such as organic acids, hydrogen peroxide, biosurfactants, and bacteriocins. In experimental studies in epithelial cells and macrophages, metabolic products of specific lactobacilli and bifidobacteria prevented vesicular stomatitis virus infection in a strange specific manner. Basically, again, in the petri dish, they produce things that can basically take out those lactobacillus, those strains, like the uh, lactobacillus and the bifidobacteria can produce metabolic products, generally organic acids, things like that, that can go and kill that virus infection. Super Mario Brothers, how you doing? <coughs> so, yeah. In addition, metabolites of bacteria in yogurts showed antiviral activity, inhibiting influenza virus replication. The induction of low-level synthesis of nitric oxide may also be involved in protection of probiotics against viruses in respiratory cells, as shown in alveolar macrophages in vitro. However, it should be noted that respiratory virus infections, uh, sorry, infect cells with different, uh, try that again. However, it should be noted that respiratory viruses infect cells with different mechanisms by using various receptors, and also the antiviral effects of probiotics are strain-specific. All right, moving along. Immunomodulation. Cell media immunity. So, induction of antiviral cytokines, such as interferons, as well as pro inflammatory cytokines and chemokines upon antigen recognition in epithelial cells or underlying effector cells. So, macrophages, dendritic cells, neutrophils. They play a key role in virus infections by initiating cell mediated viral elimination and adaptive immune responses. Probiotics may mediate their antiviral effects against respiratory uh, viruses, possibly by eliciting systemic immune responses via gut or enhancing cellular immunity in the airways with increased activity of natural killer cells and macrophages. In the gut epithelial cells and or antigen-presenting cells, probiotics are recognized by toll-like receptors. Probiotics may therefore modulate cytokine expression patterns through their epithelial cells and through underlying professional, uh, uh, professional antigen-presenting cells, such as macrophages and dendritic cells. Many experimental studies in vitro and animals show that specific strains are capable of providing protection against virus infections by stimulating antiviral cytokine and chemokine responses in the respiratory and gastrointestinal tract cells, or, or sorry, gastrointestinal epithelial cells or immune cells. Moving forward. 
Um, humoral immunity. Data from animal studies indicate that strains like bacilli and bifida bacteria provide protection against respiratory virus infections by inducing the synthesis of virus-specific aminoglobulins. So this is all stuff we were talking about before, but uh, basically they're in the uh, respiratory secretions and in serum, so in the blood. In addition, studies in healthy human subjects suggest that specific probiotics may enhance the immunogenic uh, immunogenicity of viral vaccines. l raminosis was, uh, GG, was effective in inducing protective immune response against H3N2 strain of the influenza virus vaccine. Moreover, L from uh, Lactobacillus fermentum, uh, whatever those letters, ingestion in adults resulted in lower influenza-like illness. Increased proportion of natural killer cells in uh, blood, significantly higher tumor necrosis factor alpha, and increased anti-influenza, specific IgA1, Ig, uh, sorry, Ig, IgA, and IgM after influenza vac vaccination. Consumption of uh, bifidobacterium animalis and lactobacillus, uh, lactobacillus BB2, uh, B2, B12, or lactobacillus paracaceae, uh, species pa uh, paracaceae, alcaceae. Yeah. Also showed significantly greater uh, increase in influenza vaccine specific uh, IgG antibodies in plasma and secretory saliva. Basically, what they're saying there is that by giving the vaccine with the probiotic, it was actually able to increase the efficacy, the effectiveness of that vaccine. And in the video we did regarding vaccines, I talked about before that if we were to transfer over vaccines to a method where they were delivered ideally in the spore form, which more on that again in a little bit, then I would be very much in favor of vaccines. That is much more of a natural introduction method for a virus is to introduce it into a system the way it would normally through your gut or other whether it be the mucosal associated lymphoid tissue or gut associated lymphoid tissue so either even aerosol sprays would be a decent method the aerosol sprays seem like a good idea or ingestion ingested in the spore form to basically ensure that the virus will be able to get into your system and some of the studies are showing that, yes, they actually, not only will that make it more effective, it'll actually, or not only would it be a better delivery method is what I'm proposing it, but it may actually improve the efficacy, improve the effectiveness of it. But yeah, so increase the influenza-specific antibody titers after influenza vaccination, especially against influenza B virus. These studies suggest that orally ingested lactobacillus and bifidobacteria have an adjuvant-like uh, effect on the humoral responses. Summary and conclusions, the aim of this review was to summarize the current literature investigating the effects of probiotics and respiratory virus infections in cell models, in animal models, and in humans. In addition, possible antiviral mechanisms of probiotics and respiratory virus infections were discussed. Probiotic therapy may offer an interesting alternative in the alleviation and prevention or, sorry, or prevention of viral respiratory tract infections, which cause a significant health and economic burden to humans. Based on this review, clinical trials in human subjects show promising data demonstrating that specific probiotics are able to shorten the duration or reduce the risk of respiratory infections. However, only a few clinical trials have actually investigated the effects of probiotics on specific viruses, which are the most common causing agents. Thus, more clinical research should be done targeted uh, to reveal which probiotics or their combinations would be most effective against respiratory tract infections. Now, again, this paper was written in January 2014. That was almost four years ago. In that time, more literature has, and my cap's gone, whatever. More has been done, and that's actually what we're gonna go to next. So for our next paper, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at one regarding specifically the spores. So this one here was a paper published in the Journal of Antimicrobial Agents and Chemotherapy. And this one actually, was published uh, relatively recently. It was actually a 2017 paper. So brand new, fresh off the presses. And let's pop on to that one. This one was published in June. So it was about six months old. And this one is Star Starosilla et al. A bunch of, I don't know, Croatian names, Russian names. Where are they from? Auburn, Alabama? Ukraine. Ah, I called it the first time. So the, yeah, that's the last guys in Alabama. <laughs> is the Gromachevchi Institute of Epidemiology, uh, Epidemiology and Infectious Diseases, the Academy of Medical Science of Ukraine, Kiev, Ukraine. So we're getting involved in some Russian collusion over here. 
All right. This here, the paper is specifically with respect to, I should mention the title, I'm just busy laughing at the everything else, anti-influenza activity of Bacillus subtilis probiotic strain. And why is that important? Well, let's pop on over. Inside of Megaspore, when we look at our five in Megaspore, uh, that way, our five primary strains, number two is Bacillus subtilis HU58. And you can't see that here. Maybe you can see it. Uh, there we are, Bacillus subtilis. <coughs> so, moving forward, let's look at the antiviral activity of Bacillus subtilis. Relatively brand new study. Now, to be clear, this one is done in vitro and in mice. So, unfortunately, it is a brand new study, but un also, unfortunately, it is not a human study. But let's move forward anyway. Let's take a look at what they say. So, among Bacillus bacteria, Bacillus subtilis is the most productive species of antimicrobial compounds. In the study, we analyzed the, the activity of probiotic strain Bacillus subtilis 3 against uh, influenza virus. The antiviral effect of the strain has been demonstrated in vitro and in vivo. New peptide P18 produced by probiotic strain was isolated, purified, chemically synthesized, and characterized. Cytotoxicity studies demonstrated no toxic effect of P18 on maiden, Marbear, uh, maiden Darby canine kidney cells, uh, even in the highest test concentration. Complete inhibition of influenza virus in vitro was observed at Concentrations of 12.5 to 100 uh, micrograms per milliliter. Uh, micro nanogram. I always forget what the hell the new symbol is. Let's figure that out. It is microgram. <laughs> nanogram is NG. Muji is microgram. Because sometimes it's, it's the Muji and then other times it's MCG and it throws me off. Brain's fried. So 10 to the negative 6 grams. So it's the order of magnitude smaller than a milligram. So micrograms. Anyway, back to the paper. Protective effect of P16 in mice was comparable with Tamiflu. And a lot of people get put on Tamiflu, right? Well, for the, in this particular one, the actual effects were as beneficial as Tamiflu. Further study will assess the potential of peptide P18, an antiviral compound, and as a promising candidate for the development of new antiviral vaccines. Now, again, I'd prefer you actually just take the Bacillus subtilis, but, you know, we'll get there. Introduction probiotic bacteria attract more attention of scientists and physicians as the important tools for correction of microbiota and maintaining the health status of the host. Different mechanisms are known for beneficial effects of probiotics, production of antimicrobial substances, upregulation of immune response, and downregulation of inflammatory response, Stimulatory, uh, stimulation of mucus secretion, and uh, dendritic cell uh, maturation, improvement of gut mucosal barrier function and modulation of host gene expression. We've talked about a bunch of that in the last paper. Probiotic bacteria showed efficacy in the treatment and prevention of differentiation in gastrointestinal conditions, including inflammatory bowel disease, irritable bowel syndrome, Necrotizing enterocolitis, necrotizing enterocolitis, acute diarrhea, antibiotic associated diarrhea. New applications of probiotics are focused on conditions influenced by altered gut microbiota, such as metabolic syndrome, obesity, atopic dermatitis, mood disorders, which all of those we've talked about before in both individual videos and live streams. Probiotic bacteria were tested for prevention and treatment of viral infections. Different strains of bifidobacterium and lactobacillus demonstrate beneficial effects in treating rotavirus infection in animals and humans, and some orally administered probiotic bacteria stimulated respiratory immunity and increased resistance to viral, uh, viral respiratory tract infections, which the last paper we talked about said the same. The oral or intranasal treatment of lactobacillus strains of infected in mice have reduced signs of influenza infection, the virus titer in the lungs or nasal washings, and increased body weight during infection and also improved mice survival. Effectiveness of probiotic bacteria in respiratory tract infections was confirmed in clinical trials in children, adults, and elderly individuals. Although animal studies and clinical trials demonstrate antiviral activities of specific probiotics, 
<coughs> the mechanism of these effects are unclear, which again, we talked about the potential mechanism before. Anyway, moving forward. Our previous study showed beneficial effects of probiotic strain Bacillus subtilis in prevention and treatment of bacterial infections in animal models and in clinical trials. So clinical trials generally are humans. So Bacillus subtilis, good for bacteria. What about viruses? The antibacterial activity of this probiotic strain was associated with the production of antibiotic aminocupacin, which is a broad spectrum of pathogen suppression, uh, which had uh, with a broad spectrum of pathogen suppression. So it kills a, uh, you know, a wide variety of potential bad microbes. And with the simulation of immune resistance of the host, so boosting the immune system. Previously, we found that some bacteria can produce peptides mimicking hemagglutinin, <laughs> of influenza virus, mimicking proteins gains a way to find a uh, new therapeutic compounds for treatment of pathogens. Bacteria of the Bacillus genus are considered a promising source in the search of new inhibitory substances because of their capacity to produce a large number of antimicrobial peptides. The study aims to evaluate the antiviral act activity of Bacillus subtilis probiotic and to characterize compounds responsible for this activity. All right. Let's move forward. From there, we have, oh, hold on, sorry. Popped away for a second there. Oh, did it again. Fingers slipping. <laughs> we have our results and have our activity of bacillus subtilis in vitro and in vivo. So, previous toxicity studies showed no toxic effect of Bacillus subtilis on uh, MDCK, so canine kidney cells, in concentrations of 10 to the negative, uh, 10 to the seventh, and 10 to the ninth CFUs or colony forming units per milliliter. Incubation of influenza virus with Bacillus subtilis bacteria resulted in significant inhibition of virus replication. So, putting the the Bacillus subtilis in with the virus basically went and prevented the virus replication. <clears throat> the Bacillus subtilis strain was also effective in prevention of influenza infection in animals. Mice challenged with lethal dose of influenza, virus began to die on day five, and all were dead day eight post-challenge. Pre-treatment, Bacillus subtilis protected 30% of the animals from deadly infection. It's pretty impressive. <laughs> from there, uh, isolation characterization of peptides, not really as important for us right now. Characterization and validation of chemically synthesized peptide. Again, not as important because they're talking, they're talking specifically about one peptide. I'm more concerned about the probiotic in general. Um, if you are interested in that, again, down below, I actually have a timestamp too uh, for the 30 second mark, uh, 30 minute mark, which is about when we started this paper. Um, you can get the full paper at that link. So the anti-influenza activity of Bacillus subtilis. Efficacy of the P18 in vivo. So, basically, the treatment of animals with P18 and town flu before infection resulted in significant protection in comparison with the control, 30% and 80% respectively. Significant efficacy of P18 was observed in animals treated after virus inoculation. Single oral application of P18 protected 80% of rats. The rate of survival after town flu treatment was 70%, so it was actually slightly better than the town flu. All survived animals did not show any visible signs of influenza. Viral titer in the lungs was significantly lower in mice penetrated, I was like pre-treated with town flu in uh, comparison with control P18, control and P18. But treatment of mice with P18 after infection was more effective in elimination of the virus than town flu. So essentially what they're saying there is that if you took the Tamiflu before the virus takes hold, you're probably going to see better results than with the probiotic. However, once it's already taken hold, it's actually going to outperform the Tamiflu. Interesting thought there, but let's move forward anyway. How long they actually were being treated with it beforehand, a couple of variables that could change it up, but moving forward. Influenza is still a significant health problem, which results in high morbidity and mortality in the USA and worldwide. Therapeutic approaches used for prevention and treatment of influenza infection include aminonides, uh, neuroaminidase inhibitors, and vaccines. However, some adverse effects of uh, 
of used antiviral compounds and the drawbacks of vaccination indicate the need for improved therapies and preventative treatment of influenza infection. Different alternatives have been tested to combat the influenza virus. China's Ministry of Health, for example, recommended extracts from some natural herbs having beneficial immunomodulatory effects. More and more scientific data suggests that probiotic bacteria can be effectively used to decrease the risk or duration of influenza symptoms. Beneficial effects of lactobacillus and bifidobacterium strains have been shown in animal models and clinical trials. Our study was aimed to evaluate antiviral efficacy of Bacillus subtilis probiotic strain. Bacteria significantly inhibited influenza virus replication in vitro and increased survival rate of mice challenged with the virus after a single dose of probiotic bacteria. <coughs> Protection of mice against influenza virus by oral pretreatment with lactobacillus rhamnosus was reported by Song et al. And oral, authors orally treated animals with lactobacillus for two weeks before a challenge with a lethal dose of virus. In another study, uh, two week treatment with killed spores of bacillus subtilis, PY979, protected mice from influenza infection. So they actually gave them the bacteria, but they had actually killed the bacteria first. The rate of protection with a single dose of live bacillus subtilis uh, three cells was comparable results presented by Sang et al., which was the elect, uh, lactobacillus rhamnosus uh, M21. Previously, we found that some bacteria can produce peptides mimicking hemagglutinin of influenza virus. Thus, we decided to analyze whether the mechanism of bacillus subtilis three antiviral activities associated with the production of antiviral peptides, which is why they went specifically for that H18. <coughs> Mimetic peptides were isolated from the culture medium after 24 hours of growth. Yeah, they go through again some of the way that was done. Um, thus, Torres et al. Uh, characterized the virucidal effect of the bacterial uh, bacteriosin subtiloso, subtilosin produced by Bacillus amylo. Yeah, you got me on this one. Amylolyke fasciens. Amylolyke fasciens. Probably. Against herpes simplex virus. Subfractin and biosurfacant produced by Bacillus subtilis inhibit a broad spectrum of viruses, including Semliki forest virus, herpes simplex virus, suede herpes virus, vesicular stomatitis virus, simian influenza, immune deficiency virus, huh, so basically monkey AIDS, <laughs> instead of HIV, it's SIV, feline calci virus, and murine uh, encephalomyocardi uh, encephalomyocarditis. <clears throat> a virus. The authors postulated that the antiviral actions of these compounds were due to physiochemical interaction of membrane active surfacant with the virus lipid membrane. So basically, they prevented adsorption, like we talked about in the last paper. High antiviral uh, in vitro activity of surfactant and fengicin uh, uh, were also confirmed by other scientists. Testing of antiviral compound produced by Bacillus bacteria have been done only in vitro. We studied the efficacy of synthesized peptide B16 for prophylaxis and the treatment of influenza infection in animals. <coughs> Excuse me. Prophylactically, in the mice they treated in this particular study, Tamiflu was more effective, showing 80% effect uh, protection. However, therapeutic efficacy of, of the peptide from the bacillus was highly pronounced and compared to the Tamiflu, 80% versus 70% of mice protection accordingly. Anyway, moving forward, to our knowledge, is the first report about the isolation and identification of bacillus peptide with strong activity against influenza virus. Peptide P18 has a complete homology with a structure of influenza A neutralizing antibody. We speculate that the mechanism of antiviral activity of this peptide is that it is similarity to neutralizing antibodies. This can be confirmed by results of an in vitro testing, where P18 showed a higher protective effect for animals in treatment mode of application. The study of molecular mimicry provides a new concept in the development of new antiviral drugs and vaccine development. In summary, we showed the activity of probiotic strain bacillus subtilis against the influenza virus in vitro and in animals. New peptide P18 produced by a probiotic strain was isolated and characterized. P18 inhibited influenza virus in vitro and its protective effect in mice was comparable with Tamiflu. <coughs> Excuse me. Damn. <laughs> so, long and short, mostly long until now, but here's a short version. Probiotics 
Definitely a good idea. Can potentially be as effective at combating viruses as Tamiflu, in this case specifically influenza. But as the article also or the paper also discussed, there are other ways that it could be beneficial as well. Here's another quick one. We're not actually going to go through this one right here, but <coughs> I put the link to the article down below. Just because we're already at 846. But real quick, uh, this is Kido, uh, Kidazara and Valeni. Modulation of respiratory TLR-3 antiviral response by probiotic microorganisms. Lessons learned from lactobacillus rhamnosus. And the short version, we, uh, basically what happens is, <coughs> it's another one discussing the potential mechanisms by which the probiotics can potentially exhibit antiviral effects. So I'm not going to go through this one, but if you are interested, it is down below. It is below the... Uh, Starokiki, it's the Kiwazara, it's a right down there, links there. This one is not behind a paywall, so you can read it all yourself, for, just for funsies. <clears throat> all right, last one. We're going to talk about seaweed. What? That's right, seaweed. <clears throat> Jesus, not my day right now. So, right here, I'm going to actually drop the, the ballpark timestamp on this. That way, anybody who is watching this on the replay who has survived this long can uh, be able to jump right in if they're looking for that. About 47 minutes in. <coughs> Excuse me. I really can't win right now. <coughs> Might have to call us one soon. It's just this. This last part of this cough is really kicking out. I'm going to take some uh, echinacea real quick. Or maybe, you know what? I'm going to drop some honey real quick. It's got a little bit of scratch. Hold that top part. Got myself a nice little, uh, some raw honey. All right, seaweed. So for those of you who really like sushi, awesome stuff. Emergence of seaweed and seaweed-containing foods in the UK. Focus on labeling, iodine content, toxicity, and nutrition. And don't worry, it's not just for the Brits. It's good for us, too. <laughs> this is a decent, a relatively decent paper uh, that's newer-ish. <coughs> But okay, seaweed or edible algae is not a staple food in the Western diet. Despite occasional use as a traditional ingredient in coastal areas, high nutritional value combined with expansion of health food industry has led to a resurgence of seaweed in the British diet. While seaweed could be useful in tackling dietary iodine insufficiency, consumption of some species and sources of seaweed has been associated with risks, such as toxicity from high iodine levels or accumulation of arsenic, heavy metals, and contaminants. Current retail level of <coughs> seaweed as well as whole foods or ingredients had, was evaluated with particular focus on labeling and iodine content. Seaweed containing products were identified. Only 22 products, 10% stated information regarding iodine content, and another 40, 18%, provide information sufficient to estimate the iodine content. For these products, the median iodine content was 110 micrograms per gram and 585 micrograms per estimated serving. While calculations for iodine exposure per serving rely on assumptions, 26 products could potentially lead to an iodine intake above the upper tolerable limit of 600 micrograms per day, based on European estimates. <coughs> Excuse me. In the context of the data presented, there is scope to improve product labeling. So again, this is more about... Oh, man. I got this itch right now. Now, while this one's more about overall the labeling and everything else, real quick, we're just going to go through some of this. You know, it's the rich source of uh, micronutrients, uh, high, bio, so high availability, low cost. It's been used as a fertilizer, animal fodder, medicine, cosmetics, and even in folklore. It's, although, however, it's not a common part of the modern Western diet. Regular seaweed consumption, however, has been concerned about, you know, toxicity. 
However, seaweed is widely present in Asian diet and has been found to have health benefits and possible benefits against chronic diseases such as cardiovascular disease, cancer, and diabetes. <coughs> Son of a bitch. <laughs> Concerns over toxicity and exposure to high level of iodine are mitigated by the scrutiny of the seaweed species. There are more than 50 commonly eaten species, and the waters in which it was farmed are har harvested. So yeah, don't start eating seaweed that's coming out of, like, Fukushima. Probably bad luck. But, for example, the iodine content of seaweed varies from 16 nanograms, oh, sorry, micrograms per gram in some nori species to 8,165 micrograms per gram in Icelandic fingered tangle. So yeah, don't eat that stuff. Meanwhile, inorganic arsenic concentration is found to be low in kelp species, one of the most common edible seaweed categories. <coughs> um, yeah. So, okay. There's potential for seaweed to act as a functional food and ingredient relative to its role as a rich source of iodine, its antimicrobial properties, mainly against gram-negative microorganisms, and its satiating properties when included in food products, just beverages, and used in low sodium salts. The role of sodium, seaweed as a rich source of iodine is particularly relevant in the UK. Recent studies have highlighted insufficiency in different groups. So yeah, probably a much better idea than iodizing the salt, right? Oh no, you gotta have iodized table salt because you need the iodine. I've always have some seaweed. It's not that big of a deal. Get it in. Seafood, seafood is also, also a generally good idea to get in some iodine. However, fish consumption is low. British. What? It's decreasing. What about fish and chips? <laughs> Almost 70% of the world population is using iodized salt. No, just no. But apparently in the UK, iodized salt market is very low. Yeah, don't use iodized salt. Use pink salt. We'll talk about this. Get your, get your iodine from seafoods, ideally, in this case, seaweed. <coughs> <clears throat> Sorry, I um, might have to call this. Then I need to really uh, up the uh, <laughs> up the the treatment for right now. But the tail end, I, I feel good, but the, my body's really trying to clear out the last bits of this this virus itself. So yeah, so those are some of the health benefits. Da -da -da -da. Yeah, and this one here is talking a bunch about the iodine content. It's actually here. This is actually a pretty cool. These are pretty cool ones here. That's the table. Um, where's the? This is the chart. Let's see. <clears throat> so iodine. Okay, figure one A is the content. What I'm gonna do is yeah. The iodine content per 100, I said micrograms per 100 grams of seaweed products with known iodine concentration. Table B is iodine content of identified seaweed products with known iodine concentration. Bar color indicates the product categories, whether it's a seaweed, a salad, a condiment, a soup, noodles and pasta supplements, bread and confectionery, and so on and so forth. So we see here that at the tail end here, we have the ones that are the highest. Let's zoom that bad boy in. <coughs> and the ones that have the highest level, we have Atlantic kelp raw, Atlantic kelp milked, whatever the hell that means, and Atlantic kelp whole dried leaf. Now, this is getting on the way too high end. Um, however, we have Japanese kombu, kombu. Green Bay Organic Fine Flakes, um, Organic Seaweed, Dulce, Bladder Rack, Kombu. So this area right here in the middle is about where you want it to be. So a lot of those right there are some of the interesting sources of <coughs> iodine intake per, per how many grams you're consuming. So this here now is the cutoff line in terms of what is the safe limit basically that's the upper tolerable limit of iodine intake so those that end up a little above it you might want to eat a little bit less those that end up below it might want to eat a little more <coughs> excuse me 
So five grams of raw dulse is almost identical, or almost I perfect for a full day. And I'm definitely a big fan of dulse. From there, kombu is a good one. <laughs> Miso soup paste, maybe not that. <laughs> oh, man. Sea spaghetti is a little high, so maybe a little less than five grams. Basically, the sh long and the short of that is you can go and have a little bit here, a little bit there, rather than worrying about getting the iodized salt. That's the short version. So in the study, you show them that seaweed is available both as a whole product and as an ingredient in a diversified range of food products. And even if it still remains a special shop product, uh, yeah, it's not, again, there's some stupid BS that's happening in the UK, whatever. I was more concerned about the graph. The graph was kind of cool. Now, exposure to excess iodine can lead to the formation of goiter, hypothyroidism, and hyperthyroidism, uh, and iodism in case of chronic exposure. Large excessive iodine intake can inhibit, <coughs> excuse me, the formation of thyroid hormones and increased plasma TSH, a phenomenon known as wolf chikoff effect, which is transient. In vulnerable groups with autoimmune thyroid disease, excessive iodine intake can also lead to thyroiditis, sensitivity reactions, and palpatory uh, pal papillary thyroid cancer. There was, however, no effect uh, between seaweed consumption and thyroid cancer when healthy Japanese women were studied. And that's another aspect of that that is commonly overlooked. Most people don't think about thyroid health, like, oh, we need to get the iodine and get your iodine. What's likely of more higher importance, I've talked about that before, is actually selenium. Selenium is probably a bigger deal. And what is some? What are some of the best sources of selenium besides Brazil nuts, which are you can get a single, you know, full daily dose and a couple of nuts, <coughs> are actually seafoods. So fish and shellfish are going to be your best bet in terms of getting in selenium. So if you're really worried about your thyroid, sushi is a surprisingly good choice. Now I wouldn't get it with all the other weird crap added to it. May be easy on the sauces. But that will help to get in some extra iodine, not crazy amounts if you're getting a little bit from the kelp that is, or rather the nori that is around the, the sushi itself. And you're also going to get in a little bit of selenium, well, not a little bit, but a decent amount of selenium. And in the case of people who are hypothyroid, you're probably going to want to get a little bit of carbohydrate in to help uh, increase thyroid function. So sushi actually is a pretty damn good food if you have thyroid issues. So yeah, just like most micronutrients, you don't want to mega dose. So just be aware of how much iodine is in that particular seaweed and it can be beneficial. Real quick, uh, last part here, the functional potential of seaweed is included in pro products composition as a salt substitutes to enhance taste and food, sorry, enhance taste, the food matrix, or to enrich the product with natural bioactive compounds. In this way, seafood, uh, seaweed can be Consider it as a product that has potential to benefit the food industry and the health of the population through its growing use. Seaweed products or uh, seaweed isolated ingredients fall within the novel foods set forth by European Union, not screw the European Union, whatever. <laughs> seaweed is a good iodine source and its contribution to the daily iodine intake should be further explored. <clears throat> Estimating iodine content of seaweed products can lead to under or over estimations estimations as the exact iodine content of a seaweed might differ depending on the processing or the exact species. From there, um, seaweed is now available. Da, da, da. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, there are six claims, all authorized claims for iodine in the European register in terms of health. The claims in terms of what iodine can do is that it contributes to normal cognitive function, normal energy yielding metabolism, normal functioning of the nervous system, the maintenance of normal skin, the growth, normal growth of children, and the normal production of thyroid hormones and normal thyroid function. So you want to make sure you have adequate thyroid health. You want to make sure you're sufficient in iodine. You don't want to mega dose it. You just want to be sufficient. Okay. Simple enough. All right. Uh, finishing up from there, limitations, whatever, conclusions, yeah. Not that important. You can read it for yourself if you really want to. Go to town. All right. All that being said, guys, thanks so much for joining me. If you're watching on the replay, love you. Awesome work. Uh, sorry for missing last week. My semester is ending soon, so I should be able to get back to actually producing some more regular content. I have some ideas to really tweak things up a little bit, make them a little bit more fun.
Other than that, make sure you head over to Sherry's, grab some uh, Coastal Craft Kombucha if you're here on the island. You know, over in Babylon Village, you can get your own. Beyond that, the fire cream, you know, crossing our fingers. Hopefully by the live stream next week, we should be relaunching. So uh, keep your eyes posted for some awesome fire cream. You can like it down below as well. Please head on over and like the page on Facebook. And yeah. Send me your questions. Hopefully, that, hey, definitely by now, I should be feeling pretty good. Um, should have this clicked at, kicked out, you know, right there. I've talked about the importance of managing your stress. Here it is. Me, and this, the way I sounded tonight, that's what happens when you don't take care of your stress. Your immune system goes down and you become susceptible to other crap. So don't do it. Manage your stress. But um, yeah, like I said, love you guys, and I will see you next week.